Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Philip Heymans. I'm an advanced data scientist at Growth Acceleration Partners. And today I'm going to give you a rundown on how you can use the Chronicle R package to easily create R markdown reports. So Chronicle aims to be an opinionated assistant to whom you can delegate the task of creating R markdown report leaving to you only the task of specifying what you want to have in your report. Here we can see uh, a small example of this. Uh, we are creating a report with a table, a rain cloud plot, some text, and a box plot. And you can see that the parameters that the, the functions ask are very straightforward. There are several other parameters for each of these functions. However, they are uh, they have very considerate default values to avoid the need for user specification. Once you are satisfied with your report, you can just call the render report function. And we can go ahead and take a look at the output. So here you can see uh, you have the table we specified with its title, then the rain cloud plot, um, with the title being automatically generated from your specifications, then the text, and finally the box plot. So all plots by default are uh, plotly plots, uh, which I like because they let you follow along uh, your discussions reg in regards to the data uh, in an interactive manner. So this is the entire list of elements currently supported by Chronicle. You can see most of them are plots but also you can send raw code uh, and decide whether or not you want to evaluate it or just show it. Uh, you can add images, plain text that renders as R markdown, um, tables, both static and the data table um, HTML widgets. And um, as I said, a, a lot of plots. So by now you're probably wondering what's happening behind the scenes. How, how does uh, Chronicle create your R markdown reports? And if you print your uh, the report that we defined here, you can see that it's literally writing an R markdown report for you. So you have one chunk for every element you have added. Well, of course the, the text is not an, an R chunk, um, but here you can see the four elements that we added are explicitly uh, written. And if you take a closer look at the um, chunks for the rain cloud and the box plot, you can see the, that they are calling the make rain cloud and make box plot functions. And those are part of the make family of functions. So these are the ones that actually do the heavy lifting of building the plot that you have ju just requested uh, according to your specifications. This can also be called uh, independently, for example, for a presentation, um, wherever um, a ggplot or an HTML widget would make sense. Um, please do not take this as an invitation to avoid learning ggplot. ggplot is a wonderful tool with a beautiful paradigm, and in my opinion, is a key part of your journey as your R practitioner. Hmm, small disclaimer there. Um, then, once we have covered the part of the content of the report, we can dive a little bit deeper uh, regarding the rendering process. So, the, uh, the render report function calls the function render from the R markdown uh, package. And if you're not familiar with the uh, with calling uh, functions to render uh, our markdown files, you are probably unaware that there is this uh, environment parameter. So um, once when you click at the knit button, uh, when you're viewing an R markdown file, you're doing it from scratch in an empty environment. Uh, however, for Chronicle, it makes sense to have visibility of your entire global environment. This is, of course, a double-edged sword, which means that if you are messy, you will get messy uh, reports with half-defined things and the sort. But if you run the uh, loading of your data, your processing, your modeling, and you get your results, um, you can use this to create several different ref results uh, reports for different audiences um, in a single call with 
only having to process the data once. So here, for example, we have the report. We want a report for our director. Our director loves using the commenting tool in Microsoft Word. So let's give her uh, a Word document. And we can even specify that it should be using the, our institutional template to keep things uh, consistent. Then we might have another niche report for another specialist team that is not concerned with most of what we do but it, they do have interest in a particular analysis we make, so we can send that, that to them. And finally, we can have our own internal report here using Plotly to um, explore the data further, makes sense. So we could use these RMD formats, which are the, the output formats that I showed you previously, and who are the default of um, the Chronicle render calls, uh, but also those tend to be a, a bit heavy in a, a large uh, file size. So perhaps we can also render as PDF for bookkeeping. And uh, this is the entire list of rendering options the render report function has. It has, it covers the basics, uh, file name, author, date, uh, etc. Um, you can choose the output format as previously shown. And these later two um, options make sense uh, if you want to make more sophisticated things that Chronicle currently doesn't handle. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't use Chronicle at all. You can ask um, the render report to only build the RMD file, but not render it and send it to um, your directory. So you there can open it up and finish uh, you know, the, the more, more complex things that Chronicle currently doesn't handle manually, and then render. Um, then there's table of content stuff, um, very straightforward. The figure width and height, which is the default for every single plot that is not explicitly specified to have a different one. Same with the plot palette. And then there's the plot palette generator, which is, um, just some sort of safeguard to make sure that uh, you don't just run out of colors and have an error in your rendering. Um, so it leverages the Veridis packages, which uh, the, the Veridis, Veridis palettes, which uh, discretize a continuous spectrum, a spectrum to have always uh, enough colors for your plots. And finally, there's the themes that you can specify depending on the output format that you're using, which uh, gives me the opportunity to mention all the output formats that Chronicle can support. So uh, here, those are split between interactive and static um, reports because um, some of them do not support using HTML widgets. And um, to to get um, feature, you, you do get feature parity with this. So you can have exactly the same content in both static and interactive report. The only thing is that the static ones are, well, a static ggplot instead of plotly translated versions of the ggplots. And to finish off the feature tour, we can go through the uh, report columns uh, function which is sort of the cherry on top of these packages. So um, we can just feed it uh, some data. For example, we'll use the Palmer Penguins uh, Penguins dataset for this example. And here you can see uh, the output. So um, it gives you two sections, the dataset overview. This is courtesy of the scheme function from the schema package. It gives you an overview of the structure of your data and then a summary for both your categorical and numerical variables, uh, including a nice little histogram. And then the second session is if you want to go deeper into your data. So here it gives you an ordered horizontal um, bar plot for categorical variables, and then a rain cloud plot for your um, numerical variables. But what happens if uh, there is like some key 
variable that will guide your analysis. For example, the species of the penguins are, are I think you're concerned the most. So you can call this exact same function, uh, but with this by column parameter specifying species. And that will give you this output, which says uh, variable analysis by species. It gives you the same data overview, but then a second data overview split by species. Again, the schema function. Um, and here you can see that the summaries are, um, you have one summary for each value of your categorical column. And also for the, um, for the numerical summary. And then uh, the variable plots, uh, you have your first uh, protagonist kind of column here. And then all other, um, var all other plots, will be uh, breaking down by uh, the, the specified column. So here you can see the rain cloud plots by species and also the bar plots breaking down by the, the species variable. And uh, to finish all up, um, sadly, this is not all roses. So we have a few limitations, uh, mainly coming from using Plotly as the, um, as the plotting package, uh, which admittedly are probably um, fixable, but I haven't gotten to the, to the perfect way to, to fix them. So there are uh, compatibility limitations with custom geometries. For example, those rain cloud plots usually will be created with the ggdist function. However, uh, ggplotlist function translator uh, does not understand that um, those geoms. So I had to manually build the, the rain cloud plots. Um, and that keeps the, the amount of functions, uh, amount of plots supported uh, currently low. Then there's the issue of the data sizes uh, because data, large data sizes translate to very large uh, file reports data size, large report size. And uh, to alleviate that, uh, Chronicle has this line in the sand that if, it's, if your data set is over 10,000 rows, it's best to have it static no matter what the output is. So. Um, this is an ugly line in the sand, but uh, this is the current uh, solution to avoid getting uh, reports of several gigabytes of data, which are, of course, uh, impossible to open in any browser. Um, then there's these unsupported formats. So uh, this is the sad, sad part of the presentation where I admit that the presentation was not created with Chronicle. And that is because um, the separators and the custom format that Sharingan uses is not the same as every other uh, supported um, format. So there is not an immediate way to render adequately the sharing and reports. Um, a similar thing happens with Flex Dashboard, which um, has its own custom layouts to contain the data, the, the plots and the content. So um, that again is technically, technically it renders, but it doesn't do it uh, in a pretty way. And then there's articles. If you're unfamiliar with articles, this is a package of templates for journals uh, for ready to publication. And please don't like, just, just don't use this package to write academic papers. Uh, it's, it won't be uh, an enjoyable process. And finally, anything that is not currently supported, uh, we do have a way to alleviate it, which is through the add code function. So if there's something you want in your report and Chronicle doesn't do it immediately, just fit it to add code and there you have it, magically uh, supported. Here you can see, it just adds this code, no question asked. So this is the Chronicle uh, report. It would be an honor if any of you take it down for, for a spin and um, hopefully it can save you uh, some time and effort.
Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Our next talk is our third talk today is on new displays for the visualization of multivariate data in the tour package by Ursula La. Um, hey, uh, good morning, everyone from Paris. So I'll be doing my talk live. So I'll just start sharing my screen. Um, so I think you should be seeing that. I'll just arrange some of this Zoom stuff as well. Thank you. Um, all right. So hi, um, good morning, everyone from Paris. My name is Ursula. I'm with uh, Boku University, which is uh, based in Vienna. Um, and what I'll be talking about today is um, some new displays for the visualization of this big multivariate data in the Tor R package. And I realized that probably the title already has um, a few things that aren't quite clear. So as I'll go through um, my talk, I'll um, explain what exactly I mean with some of those things. And I uh, want to start by explaining what is the Tor um, and what is the Tor R package. Um, and so um, maybe many of you haven't heard about the tour before, but the grand tour essentially is a display that allows us to visualize data beyond uh, maybe two or three dimensions. And the way that that works is that um, we're looking at smoothly interpolated sequences of linear projections of the data. Um, and because those are these kind of smooth uh, interpolations that uh, correspond to just slowly rotating something um, in the high dimensional space and looking at it in uh, low dimensional projections, um, we can start to understand some of the uh, um, multivariate aspects of the data. So things like um, getting intuition about the shape of the distribution, um, we can see um, clustering, or maybe we can spot some multivariate outliers. Uh, but rather than going more into the technical aspects or the mathematics, I wanted to show you some examples, which I think um, can explain um, how that works in practice and how it can be useful. So I have three examples here. I'm just going to hit play on the first one on the left. Um, so what you can see here is a grand tour showing a wireframe cube that's a four-dimensional hypercube. Um, and you probably realize that what uh, you're seeing at each um, kind of step of this animation is just a two-dimensional projection. Um, but you can also see that um, every time I'm just rotating um, the view a little bit, so um, it makes sense um, what I'm seeing now uh, with uh, what I've seen before. Um, and as we're looking at the animation, we can start to understand how this four-dimensional object actually looks like. I'm gonna stop this one here. So that works nicely with uh, geometric shapes like, like this hypercube. Uh, but also works more generally with distributions. So the second example that I have here in the middle, that's a um, posterior sample in five dimensions. Um, that's kind of a short animation here, um, but you start to see that actually those points fall on some curved surface within um, that five dimensional space. Um, so there is probably some uh, low dimensional representation of the data that we could find. Um, and then the last example that I wanted to show you is on um, grouping. So um, here's a six dimensional data set. And maybe this is a slightly unusual um, type of grouping where actually all three groups that are shown here in different colors um, pass through the same mean. Um, but uh, through the animation, we can start to see that they're actually extending in different directions in this six dimensional space. Um, something that is really hard to um, capture with just one uh, linear projection. Um, and so I'll uh, stop my intro to the tour here uh, and just kind of summarize in that uh, we've seen that we can understand some multivariate features in the data. Um, and I haven't really emphasized this, but um, each view is actually just a linear projection, um, which has certain advantages. And the big advantage, um, in my opinion, is that it's uh, really straightforward to interpret in terms of the original parameters. Um, kind of a, a drawback or a limitation with that is that once we have large data, um, the, the typical display, so kind of the scatter plot displays that I've shown you in the previous slide, uh, start to not work that well. Um, and so there's two, two different reasons or different uh, types of large data that um, would lead to this type of problem. So uh, one way of having large data would be if we have a lot of observations, so having a lot of uh, rows in our data frame. 
Um, and if you have worked with that type of data before, you uh, are probably aware that um, you start to overplot a lot of points and you might miss uh, certain features. And this is especially true if you have uh, what I'm calling here concave uh, features. So you could think of just some hollowness um, inside a distribution that um, tends to get hidden in a projection. Um, the other way of having large data would be if you have a large number of variables. So thinking about having a lot of columns in your data frame. Um, and then you have, uh, again, uh, at some point an overplotting problem, but because uh, even if you have smaller samples, if you have large number of variables, um, points tend to start to pile, pile up near, near the center. This is also called the, the crowding problem. Um, and so with uh, this talk, I wanted to talk you through some of the solutions that we've come up with, um, what we can do in terms of the displays, um, such that we can still work with tours and linear projections, uh, but better address these type of situations. Um, and to give you kind of the answer straight away, so there's two new displays that we've come up with. Um, the first one is what we're calling the slice tour, uh, where the idea is that we're only highlighting a subset of the um, points uh, based on some conditioning. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how that looks like in practice on the next slide, but just to say here that this is good for um, looking at the information more locally, uh, which can help, for example, with uh, seeing these type of concave structures that I've mentioned. Um, and this is something that works really well if you have a large number of observations. And it actually won't work at all if you don't. Um, and the second display I want to briefly uh, describe today is what we're calling the SAGE tour, um, which is uh, trying to address this second problem, so that what I was calling the crowding problem, um, by adjusting the resolution um, depending on where we are in, in the projection plane. Um, and just to mention here that uh, I'm saying a large number of uh, variables, uh, but that doesn't have to be like in the hundreds or thousands, even uh, with 10 dimensions, this is already important. And we'll see that um, when I talk a bit more about this display. Um, and since this is the use R conference, I also wanted to mention the implementation. So um, in general, tour methods are available in R in the tour R package. Um, and uh, we've added essentially these two new display functions in the package. So uh, these are called display slice and display sage, um, and they are already available in, in the version that's available on CRAN. Okay, so um, I'm gonna just briefly talk uh, a bit more about each of these two displays. So um, first, um, the slice tour. Um, what's the idea here? So the idea is that with the tour, we already, um, essentially draw projection planes for each view. Um, and the way we're looking at the data is that we're projecting the data um, and looking at it in the plane. Um, and the idea with the slice tour is that maybe we can have more uh, local information if we're also using, um, in some sense, the information in the orthogonal space. Um, so what we want to do is we want to highlight the points that are close to our projection plane, um, where we make sure that the projection plane passes through the mean or the center of the data, um, and then fade out um, all the other projected points so that we can compare uh, this kind of local view to the overall projected view. Um, this sounds maybe a bit abstract, so there's a diagram here um, that should illustrate this. So on the left, we have uh, points that are inside a sphere. Um, and you can see that at a certain angle, we have a projection plane that's passing through. Um, and then for each point in my sample, so in this sphere, I'm checking um, how far it is um, orthogonally to the projection plane, how far is it away from, from the plane. Um, and what you can see here is that I'm highlighting everything that's within a certain um, distance from, from the plane. So this is this H, um, which we could call the slice radius. Um, and then everything else gets grayed out. And so I could compare um, the, the points that are captured in the slice to everything else in the projection. Um, and I don't have a lot of time to show you examples, so I picked one that I think is um, very illustrative for the method, uh, which is just looking at some geometric shapes or kind of curved surfaces um, in three or four dimensions. So um, what I have here on, on the left is the slice tour of a 3D sphere. 
um, where actually I'm doing something slightly different from what I was describing because now the, you might have noticed that the plane isn't actually passing through the center of the sphere, but I've shifted it um, to be a bit off center. So as it's rotating, as I'm changing my viewing angle, you'll see that um, the shape of the points that are captured in the slice um, is quite different. And you can really imagine that in terms of um, how you're cutting through a 3D sphere. Um, then I also wanted to include a higher dimensional example. So this is a torus that's embedded in uh, 4D space. Um, again, uh, we can see that the slices show very different kind of information from um, all these kind of faded out small points um, in the projection that you can see um, kind of in the background. And then the final example on the right here, that's again in 3D, that's a Roman surface, which I just uh, think it's really pretty to look at with the slice tour. Okay, uh, and I think I have a bit more time, so I wanted to also um, introduce the second new display, the Sage Tour, um, where, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we're trying to address this crowding problem. So maybe uh, you want to start from understanding that problem a, a bit better. Um, and really at the heart of it, I think, is that um, the way that volume from a high dimensional space gets projected onto low dimensions is really um, kind of centered near, uh, near the mean or near the center of the projection. And um, the way we were thinking about that is in terms of hyperspheres in P dimensions. So P is the dimensionality of the space. Um, and what you can see in these two plots here on the bottom, so let's first look at the one on the right. Um, so that's the volume um, in P dimensions um, and how much of the volume is captured within a certain fraction of the radius. So the fraction of the radius is on the x-axis and then the relative volume um, on the y-axis. And uh, we see how that looks like for 3, 10 and 100 dimensions. And what you notice is that as we're increasing P, as we're increasing dimensionality, um, a lot of the volume starts to get pushed out towards the maximum radius and with P equals 100, that's already really extreme. Um, but now what is interesting is that actually the opposite thing starts to happen um, once we're projecting from this high dimensional space. And so what you see is that um, once we're projecting and I'm looking at where in the plane um, the volume gets projected onto and I'm again parameterizing this with this fraction of the radius. So now that's the radius in the plane. Um, you start to see that the opposite thing happens and a lot of the projected volume gets uh, pushed towards um, the center. Um, so with P equals 100, we have most of the volume being projected in the kind of the first quarter in terms of the radius. Um, and so the idea with the Sage display is that we want to correct for this difference and we want to make sure that equal volume um, in the high dimensional space gets projected onto equal area in the two dimensional plane. Um, and the way we're doing that is with a radial transformation that depends, of course, on P, so on the number of dimensions. And a nice way to illustrate this is to look at what happens to um, originally equidistant circles. So um, what I've drawn here on the very left, I just I think those are 10 equidistant circles in, um, in two dimensions. And then I'm applying my radial transformation um, according to um, P, so the number of dimensions that I'm presumably projecting from. Um, what you'll see is that nothing much happens with um, three dimensions. Uh, you start to see things get pushed out a bit um, towards the outer edge. Uh, but as we're increasing to 10 or 100 dimensions, this gets uh, far more radical. And you start to see that uh, we're giving much more weight to the uh, more the inner region um, in terms of the projection. Um, and especially with P equals to 100, um, the first two circles basically take up most of the drawing space. Um, and again, just one quick example that illustrates the, the method a bit better. So this is uh, this maybe infamous pollen data um, where there's a really small feature hidden near the center of the distribution. Um, and if we look at that with a standard tour, we don't really see all that much, um, but using the Sage display, and so there's just two different ways of tuning the display that I'm showing you here. Um, you see that a lot of the points start to get pushed out towards the maximum radius. Um, and we can really decipher um, the word that has been hidden um, near the center for us. And I'll leave it to you to read that off. Um, and I'll use my maybe last minute um, to summarize uh, some of the talks. So um, I've just briefly introduced this new displays, the Sage and the Slice display that we've um, implemented in the Torah package. 
Um, and we've seen that we can uh, use that to see maybe convex shapes, um, see small features near the center. Um, and I haven't had time to really show you a um, kind of a bigger example, but what we found is that both of those displays can be really useful if we're trying to understand grouping in high dimensions. Um, there's actually a small example in the backup slides if you have time to look through. Um, in terms of the implementation, so if you're familiar with the tour app package, you'll find that there's a new display and a new animate function for each of those new displays. Um, I've also mentioned briefly that there's some kind of tuning parameters to this display, so I think it would be useful to have uh, an interactive interface um, for doing that, especially because it's really fast um, to generate, so it would be easy to play around with and find the, the optimal parameters that way. Um, and a final note, um, since we have defined um, slicing in this way that's just based on projection planes, uh, we have also used that definition to define um, what we're calling section pursuit. So that's um, an analogy to projection pursuit. Um, for those of you who know uh, what that is, so uh, that's essentially a way of finding interesting slices um, in the data with what we're calling a guided section tour. Um, and to finish up, I just wanted to thank all of you for listening today uh, and special thanks to my collaborators, Professor Diane Cook and Dr. Stuart Lee. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Now, we have a lot of questions. We do have time for questions. Um, the first question for you is, what is the difference between the slice store and a PCA plot? Okay, so um, I think it's more of a question already between the PCA plot or maybe a by plot and the tour. So with the PCA, you're um, essentially, you're maybe you're trying to reduce down to two dimensions so that you can draw um, a static plot of the data uh, where you're making a selection of um, well, the most interesting projection would be the one with the maximum variance in the data, whereas the tour would be just um, showing you randomly selected projections, but it's trying to show you um, all the space and show you all the different um, directions to look at. So uh, PCA is good if you know you're interested in a maximum variance and you just want to have a, a static plot, whereas the tour would allow you to um, get a better, like a more global overview of your data and then um, there's kind of things in between. So you could um, look at what I mentioned just in the end, the, what's called the guided tour is again, trying to optimize some index function to pick a projection that's more interesting than um, just randomly picking any. Thank you, thank you. We also have another question. Do you usually standardize your variables before you plot them? Yes, um, so whenever you're doing um, projections that are not just uh, axis parallel. So you're um, looking at combinations of uh, variables. Um, standardizing is super important because otherwise you're just not giving equal optical weight um, to the different variables. And I would say it's even more important with uh, the slicer that I was introducing because we're um, super sensitive to this thickness, to this parameter that's um, cutting off uh, what's inside the slice or what's outside the slice. And so if you're not careful and you're not standardizing your variables, you, you will probably miss something if it's on a different scale. Right. Um, also, another question by Jonathan. How does the computational speed scale with the size of the data set? And what is the largest data set you have used? And could you suggest some paper, blog, book on grantors and genders? Um, yes. Good, good question. So um, if you're just, so there's different aspects to that. If you're just running the tour in itself um, without any optimization, as I was mentioning, then um, you're essentially just, you're not really limited by the size um, of the data in terms of running the tour because all the projections are just um, sampled in terms of projection planes that are not, that they don't care about your data. Uh, but you're limited when you have to actually draw it. So um, if you're running it live, um, just the uh, speed with which you can redraw all those points can be limiting. 
Um, but one solution that I have used um, in the past is that I can just record everything and then um, if I'm generating a GIF, I just uh, make a bunch of uh, PNG files. Um, and in that sense, um, you can really work with arbitrary size of data. Um, it starts to become an issue if you want to do some kind of optimization where you're looking for more interesting views of the data. Um, in that case, you have to evaluate an index function on each new view, and that can be really slow if you have a large uh, set of data points. Um, I would say that a couple of thousand uh, points still works uh, well, but um, I haven't tested anything that goes beyond that. What is the largest data set you have used? Um, so I'm, I'm trying to remember because with the slice tour, because we are um, cutting through, uh, we have had pretty large data sets because once you're increasing dimensionality, you need a lot of points to begin with, um, such that you're even capturing anything within the slice. And I'm sure there were a couple thousand points in those data sets, but I, I don't recall the exact numbers. Can you mention some R packages for plotting multidimensional data? That is another question. Um, yeah, so of course uh, the Tora package is a good place. <laughs> um, another one that I would recommend is the GGLA package, which has um, implementations of parallel coordinate plots and um, scatter plot matrices, um, which, yeah, I think those are the main ones that you should be aware of. Oh, and I wanted to come back to the previous question on um, kind of reading on the tour because I just wanted to point out that we've recently written a review paper. So if you look for that, um, that will have some good introductory information. Excellent. Thank you. Your talk was wonderful and thank you for taking all the questions. Thank you. Um, can I maybe ask a quickly a question? Of course. Um, maybe it's a little bit going to mo towards my uh, my talk. So, did you try out um, not plotting in the the actual thing in two dimension, but in three dimensions? Yeah, uh, there is. I believe there is an implementation of that in the Tura package. I'm just not um, that big a fan of it because if it's three dimensional and it's also moving, I think it's just too much information to process uh, for somebody um, looking at it. But a do you think that some people find it actually easier to work with that display? Okay. Um, and in that case, I think it's just uh, kind of trying to um, show depth uh, by showing the maybe the size of the points. I don't really, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. well, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you. Um, our fourth talk today is on plot via. Walk through your data by Philip Thomas. Welcome, Philip. Yes, um, thank you. Um, yeah, um, you know there's this lag between submitting a talk and giving it. So in the meantime, it was renamed to plot VR uh, from plot VR to plot AR. Um, you will see a little bit maybe why. Um, yes. Um, so let's go, uh, maybe just, aha, uh -huh, I need to share my screen. That's, Please do. So, um, that's, yeah. Um, so I think you can see it now. Yes, they can see your screen, Philip. So, just one moment. I, I'd like to have the chats and Q&A open in the second window. So now I'm organized. Okay. Yeah. So thanks. Um, as I was saying, it's now called uh, Plot AR, uh, Plot VR. Uh, now I'm completely confused. Uh, plot AR, it's now called. Um, so maybe quickly about um, myself. Um, Okay, I need to shift this away as well. Um, I hold a PhD in mathematics. I'm um, now a managing consultant at D1 Solutions in Zurich. Um, I'm doing mostly projects um, in data science, machine learning, um, and as well visualization. Um, so that's maybe a little bit um, 
connected to what I will be talking about today, but actually what um, Plot AR is, is, is completely in my free time. So I, I'm doing it on, on weekends and, and off time. So it's sometimes a little bit slower in development right now. Um, uh, yeah, there are a couple of other projects. If you want to, you can look into those. Quickly about D1. We are maybe one of the may, uh, most talented data teams in Switzerland. Um, we do all of the data-driven value creation, starting with uh, bringing data into a data warehouse, uh, working on data experience, like working in dashboards with Power BI or Tableau or doing um, specialized in D3. Then also um, where most of my work is, is in machine learning AI. We are over 90 um, consultants now and are still hiring. So if you're interested, reach out to me, or if you're interested in, in our professional services, um, contact us. Okay. Um, so we have heard a lot about how we all love to visualize our things and we produce, uh, we put much effort into producing really cool visualizations. Um, but now and then we all see that there's this gap. So um, that it, kind of um, doesn't fit maybe into these two dimensions that we are all used to because of our displays. Um, and actually there is a, a mathematical theory behind that. So in probability, the, uh, you know that the, um, the random walk in two dimensions is recurrent. So there's not er enough room to go um, to cover lots of spaces. You always end up again in the same place. It's It's kind of too, too small. And the third dimension, you might think it's just 50% more, uh, but actually in, in, in three dimensions, random walk is transient. So you, um, if you walk uh, around, you will eventually leave um, that part of um, where you started and go into different parts. So um, there's a, a fundamental difference between two dimensions and three dimensions. And yeah, so we all um, try to put them with the standard packages, um, um, uh, do 3D plots, but we, um, as, um, uh, as my previous um, um, uh, talker uh, just said, it's, it's kind of, it's always a barrier. So you, in the end, you have just a 2D, um, uh, an interactive 2D projection of your 3D data. And, it's, it's okay maybe for, for some people or for some things to look into it, but it doesn't feel really th like 3D. So if you are um, happy enough, um, you might have access to, to a 3D monitor. So there you really see a 3D impression of, um, um, of your models. Um, I think that's mostly used in, um, in um, molecules design and in engineering maybe, but as data scientists, um, probably our employers won't think that's a, a good thing to spend the money on. So is there a way to get a feeling of the 3D uh, environment using stuff that you have lying around? And when five years ago, the uh, Google announced the cardboard project, I immediately thought, hey, that's the thing um, where I want to go into um, uh, to look really in a 3D sense into my data. And in the last, I guess, two years, um, there's a huge investment uh, by all the tech companies into AR. So the idea is now um, of Plot AR to put, um, to give you uh, an open source package. You can just start up and uh, you, you install it and you have it. Um, the possibility to use your the AR in your um, in your phone in your smartphone to do the um, to walk through your data. So let's see. Um, I'm now trying my luck with the demo gods. It's a little bit more involved um, demo, so um, bear with me. Um, oops. Um, you see here, I'm here now on mybinder.org. So you actually can just, uh, I will share with you the link later. You can just go um, and start this R Studio on the web and it will work um, for you. You can then open up here the demo.r um, and that's what we are, um, will start with. So you load the necessary libraries. 
you don't need to start the server actually here on my binder because it already um, is running behind. And then you just take, yeah, let's start with Iris. Um, you uh, paste it in your plot AR function um, and say the color should be come from the species column. So let's see. Oh, what was that? I, I don't know. There was maybe a thunder here. Oh, no. So after I have opened, um, issued that. OK, that was close. <laughs> I hope it's a good sign. Um, so um, yeah, it opens up here in the viewer this uh, part um, with um, it's it's called keyboard. So you immediately see here a two D projection of your three D model, but that's not the thing that we want to look into. So what we actually want to do is we want to see this now in the AR of our iPhone. So I'm using here an iPhone. It should also work on um, on Android. So. In order that you see what happens here, um, I have this um, um, this, uh, this sharing of my uh, phone screen, and actually I'm just using um, the standard uh, camera um, of iOS. Um, on Android, you actually need to install a, a QR code reader for that. Um, but um, since a couple of years, that's now uh, there's a, now a standard um, possibility here. You go onto your screen, you immediately see the uh, pop-up, and bang, you are there. So no installation needed. Oops. Okay. Yes, back there. Um, the only difference is that you see here now in the um, in the viewer uh, a small icon. Um, so um, I'm gonna tap on that, and I'm immediately here in an AR session. I need to find a plane, and ta-ta! I'm now here walking through um, Iris. So maybe I. I put it um, on a different, uh, on a larger part here. So you really see now you can walk um, through your data. And you have the, um, the 3D image um, impression because you actually can go to the data points. If it doesn't fit you, you can um, uh, shift it around by just tapping and dragging, or you can um, pinch to zoom, so to make it, uh, for instance, smaller, you have a better overview, you really can um, go here into, into the data, you see what the axis, um, what they are, and so on. You done? Oh, it lost the feed again. Huh? Okay, I hope you got that. Um, mostly. Okay, sorry, sorry, there's, yeah, I, um, I will show it again. So, like that, you can um, shift around, um, you can pinch and zoom. Um, like that, you can walk, go through the data like that. And you have really the 3D impression, and it's not a, a translation of your data, uh, of your mouse movement into a projection you don't understand. It's something you, you are used to. Um, you can just uh, go th uh, to the data as, as, as you would in a real setting. So you have the impression of a, a real data there. So the screen share is gone again. So now um, you can even go and um, that's it. Say the size should be the um, at a length. I think was missing. Um, let's see. No, the petal width was missing.
So reload it. And here now you have really all the four dimensions of um, uh, of iris visible, and you can go through. Um, I will now maybe question. Ah, I think I see here already more um, um, more um, uh, keyboards and uh, keyboards and devices going on. So I guess um, people are scanning this QR code and uh, going uh, sharing my session here. Um, so yeah, um, when we did it internally, this um, this talk then. Um, many people also um, started and um, and uh, uh, had their video um, um, showing, so so you could see how they are all now uh, moving around with their phone. So that's why I'm now actually will uh, are going to my local installation um, for um, for this part. So you can also, for instance, um, say. I want to um, have some, I have some text in my data here. I only have like the species, um, so I will do that. Um, like this. So it needs to load. Actually, I can again go to my QR code and open it up. So you see it figures out what is the correct IP address that it should connect to. It shouldn't just connect to localhost because it's a different device. Um, so and now I can again look it up here. Um, and I have uh, the text. This is, for instance, I'm using a lot um, with sentence embeddings or, or document embeddings, word embeddings. Um, I'm um, using those plotting uh, using TSNI to to go down to three dimensions, and then I have more more impression than if I would would have gone to do that uh, to do that uh, two dimensions. Um, I have also an iOS app I have been working on. Um, so here again, you have directly a QR code uh, um, um, button, and now I'm connected to. Um, to this session, I can open it up. So immediately I have here my um, my thing. And now um, sometimes in this um, for the, 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 the iOS app is, is interesting because it gives you um, the possibility to have a better connection between your um, your device and what you're doing. So for instance, I have here the possibility of this keyboard to move my data forward. So it moves forward on my phone or backward. Um, I can push it up. Um, uh, that's uh, obviously the wrong way, but yeah, it's still in, um, in development. Um, you can even use here your keyboard to be like in a first person shooter, um, um, just uh, hit W or S and so on, and uh, uh, yeah, you are there. Okay, so that's um, this example. Um, I think I don't have too much time anymore, so if you want to, you can go through the other demos. I have here um, the gap reader, um, for instance. So um, this data. Unfortunately, I have not no animation yet, but that's um, I will come to you soon. Oops, where did it go? Yes, no, you cannot see it anymore. Why not? Okay. It always yeah, there it is. Ah, it's too big. That's why I didn't see it. Um, so I need to make it smaller. Um, so that's weird. That didn't happen before. Yeah. So there are still some things now and then, but I think you get the impression uh, what you can do. You can even do the Brownian motion. Um, 
that I, I talked to you about. So you know that in two dimension, it looks some, like something like that. But in three dimension, you can um, then uh, Okay, I have a, I don't have a good connection here. Okay, I, I will skip that now, but please use it. Um, there's even the possibility to draw surfaces, um, which is really nice um, like that, um, because you then really can go through your um, data. Okay, demogods were not extremely willing, but um, I hope you got the, um, the gist of it. Um, so if you want to go further, you can always um, go onto the um, onto this uh, GitHub um, page. Okay. Here, or you can start your own session on my binder using this link. Um, you will get um, the same thing um, um, that I have shown you. Um, right now, it's not yet on CRAM. Um, it's not that ready, I feel, um, uh, the R package, but it, it, it will be in the next couple of months, for sure, maybe weeks. Um, it's um, also, you can install it in Python. Um, the iOS app you can also get from GitHub from my account there. There you need uh, um, the uh, um, Xcode, and in order to go to your um, I uh, to your phone, you need a, a free personal team, or you can uh, write me and become an early tester um, just for the app. Um, there, there, I had also at one point an, an Android version. It's now outdated. Um, um, I hope that I can invest more time into it. So maybe a little bit background. Um, how does this communication work? So you have um, in the center a server. This is actually right now a, um, implemented in, an, in Python Tornado, which is a, a web socket uh, capable server. Um, from the desktop, you use basically um, the, 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 the libraries use HTTP posts to post the data. Um, and they have um, the viewer, which is actually an, an HTML um, a, a document that is just downloaded as well from the server. Um, on the other hand, the mobile devices, they um, either go directly for this um, data JSON. You see here the format I have. So um, this is not yet fixed. I guess I will, um, uh, I will work on, on this uh, protocol here um, still. Um, or we have the possibility um, to render these um, plots not on the device um, um, in the app, but on the server. Um, into formats um, that are now supported by browsers. That's, for instance, the USD um, format uh, for, for iOS. Um, it's the GLTF for, for Android. Um, actually, um, on the MyBinder um, setting, this is actually a Jupyter server that's running there by default. That's then forwarding to our studio. Um, so in in the Jupyter setting, I'm actually embedding this server as part of this tornado that Jupyter is running. Um, and I'm handling the, the tokens. So if you go back, um, you see here the QR code is much smaller because the URL is, is small. And um, here the QR code is much more defined because in the URL here, you have actually the token as well. OK. Um, so yeah, most of the features I think you have seen. Um, I don't want to talk about those anymore. Maybe a little bit the, the outlook um, of the vision that I have there. So yeah, all of these formats that I'm now using, they are used for animation. So in Pixar, um, um, Pixar you know is animation. Um, so it it's, shouldn't be a, too a big of a problem to actually render animations in this setting. Um, it's more an organizational problem there. So how, how do you think about the protocol and stuff like that. Um, another thing, I think there was a, like a question about the tooltip. Yeah, um, I would like to have something like um, that you can tap on, on, a, on a button. Maybe even there will be some recognition that you grab something in the AR vision. But I guess for the starters, it's, you can tap on, on something. 
um, and then it can pop up um, either a, a tooltip next to the data point or it sends this information back to your desktop. So you actually have the information on the desktop. Um, both things um, are, are really possible. Then um, there is some really um, amazing thing I'm thinking about. Um, you can add, uh, that's a no brainer, different scatter point symbols, like not only the sphere, but also uh, a cross or, um, or if, say an arrow pointing in the direction. Um, and then you can add as, a, uh, as two more features, the rotation of this, um, of this scatter point symbol. If it's an arrow, that means you can plot vector fields and you can really walk through the vector field. Yeah, I want to put it on CRAN um, uh, soon enough. Um, another thing is to these um, files that are now produced, um, um, they can actually be just saved. And um, uh, um, you see on this examples page on, on my GitHub account, um, uh, examples of that. So um, here you have just a couple of files lying below, which means that you actually can um, here um, it's it's embedded, so you can drag it around, or you can open it up um, on on the uh, on the platform of your choice. So have a better um, um, uh, possibility for that. And last but not least, um, now I'm just producing single plots. I really would like to have multiple plots in in my setting, and which becomes then kind of an AR dashboard. And yeah, the funny thing is, I actually started a little bit um, and, um, working on the um, on the um, architecture slide in AR so that I could have shown it to you like um, in AR but I guess that's for 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 next year something like that so thanks a lot um, um, I'm interested in your questions thanks thank you Philip it's really interesting absolutely novel uh, absolutely novel talk. Thank you so much. We have lots of questions. Um, the first one for you would be, um, can plot AR, plot text and images as scatter point instead of circle dots? Um, yes, it, so it can text, I showed you. So basically, if you have a text column, you, you can specify that. Um, there is, for instance, um, this example here. Um, where uh, where I plot our my teammates um, at D1 um, with some very simplistic um, feature generations, and you see all the texts are different. Actually, um, for the GLTF format, these texts are um, images, in fact. So I render these texts on the server into images and can only embed those into the GLTF format. The USD format is in that way maybe nicer because you can actually just put it there and it, it always looks um, uh, crisp. Um, the downside of that is so obviously here I could also enter um, images um, for, for the scatter points. Um, uh, I had a little bit difficulty yet on, on, uh, in the USD format uh, doing images, but I think that sh um, that's just, um, yeah, it's a little bit involved, these formats and, and bringing them to the, the, together shouldn't be that big of a problem yet. So definitely that's something. So I want to have next to the names here also the, the mugshots, you know. Um, now I cannot hear you. We have another question. Um, what does the toggle flying mode do? Um, yeah, so the idea there was a little bit mostly in the VR setting that you can um, start flying and then just by looking in the direction you want to fly, you get there. And there you could then also increase speed. Um, in AR, it's it's not not a, it's better if it, so the, the the difference there maybe is in AR you can use your fingers there you don't need to fly through it in VR in this cardboard setting you only the only interaction you have on the on the device environment because it's now in a in a cardboard is that you can kind of click so so, so you have a kind of of one button. So there it was nice to be able to fly through and then also use the keyboard um, next to, um, uh, as uh, with a second hand to, to navigate through. Okay, um, one more question. Are we able to have tooltips display of the figure when we walk through the data on the phone? 
yeah, that's that's for sure one uh, one thing that I want to um, to um, to do, um, but not yet. So in USD in a USD format, there this um, that should be possible easily. Um, in the um, GLT format, it's not possible inside of the format. But I think actually what I'm using here is um, is a model viewer um, um, uh, HTML library uh, by Google, I think. Um, there, I think there is also the possibility of having interaction. And I'm not sure whether that then translates um, well into, um, into Android, but I think it should. Yeah, so that's definitely one, one thing I want to have there. OK. Um, thank you so much, Philip. Thank you so much. Looking forward to using this and it's just completely new. You know? Thank you so much. Um, we have a question for um, Philip Heyman Smith. Philip? I'm here. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, we do have um, a couple of questions that came in the Slack channel. One is What do we do if the standalone interactive output report HTML file size is large? Too many pictures yeah so uh basically the only hard stop that chronicle has is in case that one single plot is pointing to a very large data set uh computing or predicting file size from plotly outputs it's very hard so that's uh, an open question that if anyone has any suggestions i would greatly appreciate it but as of now, it will not warn you. It will just uh, hang making gigantic uh, reports that probably no um, browser can support currently. Thank you. Um, one more question. Can the Vega function be used besides um, ggplot2? Can the Vega function be used in plotly plots besides ggplot2? I think that's one. Is that one for me? I believe so. Uh, I have not experimented with Vega at all. Okay. So I would like okay. to uh, go back to that. OK, great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Philip. And um, we. I want to thank all four speakers for today um, for your talks. And up next is a 15 minute break where we can all hang out in the hash lobby channel on Slack. And after that at 7.15 AM UTC is the keynote talk, Research Software Engineers in Academia by Hedy C. Bold. With it. it has its own Slack channel at hash key C. Bold. And we'll wrap up now. I want to thank our speakers again, our sponsors, our studio and Roche, and uh, my co-host Adrian Maga as well. Thank you so much, everybody.